Amen. Praise God. God is good. Amen? Amen. All the time. All the time. God is good. Praise God. All right. Amen. So look, we're going to be in Romans chapter 4 tonight. Um, I, I personally believe that Romans 4, not really the whole book of Romans, but really the, the, the subject matter that we'll talk about tonight. I don't believe that there's anything more important in the Word of God that I could speak to you than the subject matter of what we're going to speak about tonight. Um, and because it has to do with righteousness. Really and truly, the whole book of Romans, the, the a main theme, a main element of the book of Romans is connected to God's righteousness. We talked about that last week where we learned that righteousness has a name and his name is Jesus. And I want you to know that um, tonight, you really, again, I, I keep saying it, but the whole book is connected to the righteousness of God, which is Jesus. And, that, and I can't explain to you really how important it is that you get a revelation of that. Not me just up here talking about it, but that you get a revelation of God's righteousness and how that affects your life. Praise God. And so really, Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd help me tonight to be able to declare the, the, the word of truth to your people, Lord. And that, that I wouldn't just be able to declare it, but that you'd make it real to them. That you'd make it so real that it would have an effect in their lives, Lord God. Because without a revelation of this, your people will languish, Lord. Your word says that without, without knowledge, your people perish, Lord. Lord God, and so I pray that you give us a wisdom and an understanding of your truth in Jesus' name. Now listen, I'm not asking you to learn even really what this word means. This is a complete illustration, so I don't want you to really freak out about this too much. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm writing a couple of Greek words, okay? I'm not asking this on a pop quiz. You wouldn't study it for me, right? right? But, what I'm, but what I'm, I'm trying to make a point, okay? And so here we go. And so this word here is going to be justified. And this word here is going to be righteous. And my reason for writing these two Greek words really is that I wanted you to be able to see the closeness. You see how this letter is different and then these letters are different. But the root of both of these words is exactly the same. That's all I really wanted you to see there. Uh, Dikaio and dikusene. All right. And so the, the one word justified is, is connected to the word righteousness. And, and what I want you to understand about righteousness tonight, whenever you think of righteousness, do you think about what you do or do you think about what he did? And I'm going to encourage you and let you understand that if you don't have a revelation of this, you don't really, you wouldn't know what true righteousness is. True righteousness is Jesus and the fact, and listen, in chapter five, we're going to get to the reality that, that Jesus, uh, that, that the righteousness of Christ is actually a gift that's given to us through faith, okay? And so what, when we're talking about righteousness, one of the things I used to draw this kind of thing quite a bit. But is that that born of Adam, we were born broken and dead, right? He's got scoliosis, okay? And that in Christ, when we're born again, that there's a position change. The scripture talk says this. It says that you have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Whenever you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Lord took you and he moved you out of the world and he put you into Christ Jesus. Now through that process, the word of God says that you who was born in Adam died, right? You died in Christ. Your, your first birth that was born into death of Adam died in Christ. And now you've been resurrected to newness of life. And now you've been placed in Christ. And so you've been given a new position. Does that, does that make sense yeah. what I'm saying? You have a new standing with God, and the standing is, is righteousness. This is your new position. God sees you as righteous, not because you do everything right, but because Jesus did everything right. It's important that we understand that. Some people have heard me talk about this for years now. They've been sitting in the church, and they've heard me talk about it for years. But i got to be honest with you, even talking about my own self, I've come to the realization that I could know it 
intellectually and I can even speak it from my mouth, but at the same time not have a, as much of a revelation of it as what I really need to, right? And so I want to encourage you to pray and ask the Lord that he give you wisdom and understanding and revelation about the truth that I'm desiring to speak to you. It's not about what you do or your work. See, if we don't understand the righteousness of Christ and how it was given to us as a gift through faith, then what we will attempt to do is we will attempt to earn righteousness. We will, when we fall and fail, we will try to do things in order to make ourselves right with God. Does that make sense? When, and, and listen, let me give you an example. Whenever you fall short of the glory of God, you, because you know that it's important for you to read the word of God, you may feel as though you have to read more Bible. And if you read enough Bible, you'll finally please the Lord. And then he'll, he'll say unto you, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm here to tell you, you should should always read the word of God, but you cannot earn righteousness. Righteousness is a standing with God the Father that is only given based upon the work of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross and the shedding of his blood. Because in his sinless life, in the keeping of the law, when he died on the cross for our sin, he paid the penalty of sin. And now you no longer have a guilty penalty lying over your head from your first birth in Adam. Does that make sense? In your first birth in Adam, you were born under the penalty of guilt and condemnation. I got good news for you. That's not the case anymore. Amen. God's a good God. And, and, and that's what we call when, when you get a, you need to have a revelation of this too. Because see this word right here, justified is so close to righteousness. But, but this is the difference. This is how God sees you. What did I do with my chalk? I lost my chalk already. This is how God sees you. He sees you as righteousness. This is his eyes. Okay. <laughs> he sees you as righteous because of Jesus. This is what God says about you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to draw a mouth. This is what God says about you. This is what the word justified means. It's a declaration. This is what God says. He sees you clothed in Christ. Yeah. He's not your old man anymore. See, the enemy wants to, this is what the enemy does. Whenever you fall short of the glory of God, he, he, he pounds you with condemnation. He tells you you're unworthy. Look at you. Look at you, you pitiful Christian. You're over here walking around acting like you're really serving God. And you know good and well what we did last week. You and I both know what happened last week. Now, I've got to tell you, the scripture says, be holy for he is holy. But how are we going to be holy? But first things first, I need you to understand something. He is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said he only speaks one language. He speaks the language of lies. So what I need you to understand is this, is that God doesn't see you like this anymore if you're truly converted tonight. That's very important that we keep reminding people that we must be born again. Amen. And need, there needs to be a true conversion. How will you know if you were truly converted? You will hear the word of God and at some point in time, you're going to respond by faith. You're going to say, Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me. Repentance, right? We've talked about that before where we change our mind and we, and we agree with God and we say, I need Jesus. Has everybody done that? If you haven't done that, you need to do that. You don't, you don't want to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and have never called on the name of Jesus, have never called on the blood of Jesus to forgive you of your sin, that you don't want to stand before the judge that way. The only way you want to stand before the judge is seated in Christ, covered with his righteousness, and now the Father sees you that way. And what I need you to know is this, is that if you're in Christ tonight, this is what the Father says about you, righteous. Yes. It's, a, it's the verdict. You ever been in a courtroom? Unfortunately, I've been I've been in a courtroom more than uh, I've been in a what is this Siri? Want to try to out preach a preacher? You know, but look, I've been in a courtrooms and, and and I was guilty, and and all of us have been guilty of something at a time or another in our life. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you this is that. But that's not the verdict over your life if you've given your life to Christ. Okay, I don't know how many ways I can say it. 
And I know that if I say it 10 more times, it's not going to make it happen to where you get a revelation of it. I'm here to tell you this is what the Word of God says. And if you will believe it and hope in it and trust in it and ask for wisdom from God, He will give it to you. The Scripture says in James that if you will ask of God for wisdom, He will give it to you. And there's a difference between understanding it in your mind and having a revelation of it in your heart. And when you receive a revelation of it in your heart, it will set you free. Amen. You, you won't be walking around under a burden and a cloud of guilt. You won't be always feeling like you're guilty. And then once that begins to happen, thankfulness will enter your heart. Gratitude will enter your heart. Because you will realize that in spite of yourself, God still loved you and he forgave you. So don't let the devil lie to you. Because see, if the devil's telling you you're guilty, but you know you're saved tonight, then he's lying to you. And what the word of God is actually saying is that you're free. Amen. You're free in Christ. You've been set free. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so, so what I want you to know is this, is that uh, a couple of things about the righteousness of God is that God's righteousness is for the whole world, both Jew and Gentile. Amen. And God's righteousness is given to those of faith. It's important that we understand that. It's given to those of faith. All right. Now let's look at Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says this. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? This is what it says. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So Abraham believed God. So, so God. so what we've learned so far is that the, the God's righteousness was manifested in physical flesh. And, and his name was Jesus. We learned that last week. And, and then we learned that it was his blood that was shed. Right. Okay, that allows the righteousness to be given to us. And so now in order for that righteousness to be given to us, we need to understand that it comes through faith. It comes through believing. But what I want you to understand is this, is that it's just not the standing of righteousness that's important tonight. I need you to understand that you have to understand your position of righteousness if you want the grace of God to continue to work in your life, to strengthen you, to where you actually begin to walk in the victory that Christ died to give you. Does that make sense? I need you to know there's a difference between just being able to make it into heaven yes. and Christ actually being formed in you. Yes. To where you become transformed. Uh, amen. By the grace of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Moving and operating in your yes. life. And if you're trying to fix yourself and clean yourself up, what we're going to learn if we get, um, we're going to get to the scripture is that you will actually frustrate the grace of God in your life. Yes. And what it'll do is it's actually like turning a valve off. You ever work with valves? It used to be an oil field. And, it's, and you got to turn a valve this way to open it up. You turn another valve to close it up. Okay. And so and, and you can actually frustrate the grace of God. And, and, and you can, whenever you frustrate the grace of God, you close the valve and you divert. The grace is not flowing in your life. It's not flowing in your life to do the work that needs to be done. Does that make sense? Praise God. So. What, what, what happens is, is that if we frustrate the grace of God, then, then it's like we're closing the valve off. Thank you, buddy. And, and whenever that happens, it's, 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 causing, it's causing trouble for our own spirit, man. So what, what I want to go back to is this. What did Abraham believe God for? And, and that's what I want to bring you down a little pathway with some scripture uh, to, to see what Abraham believed God for. Let's take a look at John chapter 8. Verse 39 and 40. All right, here we go. It says that they answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. 
So whenever Jesus is talking to these to these religious leaders and he explains to them, I'm over here trying to tell you the truth. Now you want to kill me. You're saying Abraham's your father, but that is not what Abraham did. And so my question now is, what was the work of Abraham and who are Abraham's children? Because they're saying Abraham was our father. Well, if we look at John chapter 6, verses 28 through 29, it says this. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Isn't that just like human beings? What do I have to do in order to please you, please God? What do I have to do to make things right? This is Jesus when he answered in verse 29. This is the work of God. Look at this. That you believe in him whom he has sent. Amen. That's, that's the work of God that we would believe in the one that he sent. Okay, and so now and then I want you to know that in Galatians, we don't have to turn there, but it says this. Know ye therefore they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. I don't know how far I'm going to get in my notes, but I want to just try to really get something across to you tonight because the Lord's really been putting this in my heart. And I think that in the next couple of weeks, not this week, but probably three weeks away on Sunday, uh, on, on a couple of Sundays, I'll be preaching out of Revelation 17. And in Revelation 17, we see an image. Because listen, guys, we're living in the last days. And it's time for people to sober up. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, people that sleep, sleep in the night. Those that get drunk, get drunk in the night. But we're not of the night, we're of the day. So therefore, we need to be sober. We need to be sober spiritually. We need to be sober-minded. We need to have our faculties about us. Because a drunk man... And I know what I'm talking about. A drunk man doesn't know where he's going. He's stumbling in the dark. And it's time for the people of God to wake up and to become sober. Amen. And to understand that spiritual things are very serious things. And that, that God made a way for, for his son to make the way for us. Amen. And that because the way has been made, we can access the presence of God because we've been given the gift of righteousness. If we didn't have the gift of righteousness, we could not enter into the presence of God. We could not commune with God. We could not have intimacy with God. All right. But, but what I need you to know is this is that that seven headed beast represents the nations of the earth that are against the plan of God, that are against the son of God. You remember a while back I preached out of Psalm chapter two It said, why do the heathen rage? Why do they, why do they consider, you know, it's, it's like they're in their mind, they're imagining the carnal things. They're imagining that they're going to take a stand against, against the son, against the, against God and his anointed one. And then in that text, God says to them, he says to his son, I will give you the nations as your inheritance. What did Jesus say? Jesus said this, go into all nations and, and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the father, the son. Son and the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to preach my Sunday message yet, but what I'm trying to say is this. What does it say in Revelation chapter 5? You are worthy to open the seal because you have purchased the souls of men with your blood from every tongue, every tribe, every nation. I'm here to tell you the nations are raging against the Lord. And I want you to know that God has a plan and those we're talking about the children of Abraham are the children of faith. And I need you to understand something tonight. You're either here or you're here. And if you're here, it means you're not converted. It means you've only been born once. And, and listen, if you've only been born once, it means you're going to die twice. But if you've been born, if you've been born twice, then you'll only die once. Amen. You need to be born again from the dead. Amen. And then the second death has no power over you. Praise God. So I want to encourage people, make sure that you've given your heart to Christ. Amen. And then what now, what you have to understand is now you're a child of God through Abraham. Why? We're going to get into the scripture more, but Abraham was the father of faith. Amen. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous. You know what the word counted means right there? It's like God put righteousness in Abraham's account. He put it in his account. He was bankrupt of the righteousness of God, but God put it in his account. Amen. Good news. Good news. Praise God. I hope you got righteousness in your account. Amen. So let's look at verse four and five of Romans four. It says to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So when you work, somebody owes you a paycheck, right? And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, 
His faith is counted as righteousness. Again, an attempt at earning a position with God that can only be granted as a grace, grace gift, which was purchased by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want you to know that there's justifying grace, which is the positional righteousness, and there's sanctifying grace. You know what the word sanctified means? Could somebody, somebody just give me a what what right there. What? what yeah, give me what it was it mean. Set apart. Set apart. We, we say this all the time. What else does it mean? Holy. To be made holy. Sanctification is a, is a big church word, but it's an important word that we understand what it means. It means to be set apart. What does that mean? Okay, break it down real time, preacher. It means that when I'm at the water cooler and all the dudes are talking about old yes. girls' backside, yes. Yes. I'm yes. not involved in that conversation. Yes. It means whenever I'm on the field cleaning pipe or whatever I'm doing, that everybody's saying all these expletive words and all of this kind of stuff like that, that I'm not talking the way that they're talking. It means that whenever I get born again and the Holy Spirit starts to convict me about things in my life, that I start yielding to the will of God instead of the will of Matt. Yes. I'm just trying to give it to you real because see, and it's not me trying to do it in my own strength. It's me recognizing that I'm not living according to the will of God because I can fulfill the conviction of the Holy Spirit if I'm saved. If you're not saved, you're not feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You might feel weird if somebody calls you out about something, but you would have never felt weird if they didn't call you out. You need to get saved. If you're still talking like the world and you don't feel bad about it, you do not want to stand before the King of Kings yeah. and the Lord of Lords facing him in that condition, my friend. It's very important that we understand this. Amen. It's very important that we understand this. Now, now, once you're saved and the Holy Spirit brings conviction, what we have a temptation to do is to try to earn something to make ourselves right. What I need you to understand is that if you will keep your faith in Christ yes. and what he did for you already, in the shedding of his blood, it allows the grace, the sanctifying grace of God to do a work in your heart, Amen. to transform you. See, the grace of God is something that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. The grace of God is the Holy Spirit of God. Moving in your life, doing for you what you could not do for yourself. The very thing that you keep struggling with. The Apostle Paul, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, but he said, let us lay aside every, he said, because of the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. He, he told us about the cloud of witnesses. He said that some were sawn asunder. Some lost their, their, the wives lost their husbands. People have given their life for the faith. I'm just being real with you, and I don't mean this to be, to be hardcore to make anybody feel any way kind of funny or whatever, because Lord knows that I felt funny because I haven't always been the boldest of witnesses but, but listen guys sometimes we get sometimes we get we shrink back because people are laughing at us because we profess Christ right. I'm here to tell you people have been sawn in half over Jesus people have lost their head over Jesus people have been thrown into pots of boiling oil because of Jesus you, you understand what I'm trying to say and that Mark the one that wrote the Gospel of Mark was drugged behind a chariot through the streets of Egypt because of Jesus. Thomas was run through with an Indian Brahmin sword because of Jesus. And in all the testimonies, what we're told is all they had to do was change their story. No, 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 no. I didn't see him to resurrect Jesus. I was just clowning, man. It is it's not really true. But no, 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 no. Jesus had so transformed their life that they were willing to give their life for Jesus. Amen. Now I don't know about you, but the way things are starting to shift in the world that we're living in, I'm thinking I need the same kind of grace that Paul had. I'm thinking I need the same kind of grace that Thomas had, that Mark had. Whenever I'm not trying to tell you that you're going to have to face that, but let me tell you, people in Syria, and listen, sometimes we talk, we give a hard time to the Catholic people. They got Catholic priests over there that refused to renounce Jesus and died. They were burned in cages. In Syria, last year, two years ago, this kind of stuff is happening in the world that you and I are living in. 
And I don't know if that listen, this is serious business because you either believe, you, we, we either believe Jesus is real or we don't. Amen. And if we believe that he is the living son of God and that, look, what does the scripture say about how you're going to overcome the devil? Y'all remember that? <laughs> What's the last part? Word. 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 Thank you. By the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own lives even unto death. They did not love their own lives, even unto death. Praise God. You know, we have, maybe not we, maybe I shouldn't throw you in there. I have had a problem with just dying to Matt's flesh. <laughs> Come on. <Yes. laughs> right? Lord, help me. Eh, you got to die to my flesh before I can die physically for the Lord. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Lord, have your way. Yeah. <laughs> have your way. Amen. Yeah. So. The scripture says that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ. And he goes on to say, if I, if I seek to be justified, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is there for Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Like in other words, if Christ justified me. And now I'm trying to make myself justified by doing works of the law. Because that's what he's talking about, the works of the law. Right? Some people will say, well, well Pastor Matt, I'm not like really trying to, to keep the, the law of Moses. But do you understand that the law is connected to works? So people that try to do things to make themselves righteous are actually trying to live according to some form of law or legalism. Does that, does that make sense what I'm trying to try? It's not, it's, you're not being made righteous by what you do. I, I know y'all got to know what I'm talking about. But back, back when I, before I understood any of this kind of stuff I'm trying to talk to you about, I would, I would go into various churches. I went to a couple of different churches, and 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 I went to church faithfully. I went to church. I paid my tithes, and I really did. I, I worked offshore, and and I and I tried. I tried to quit dipping. I threw that roll of skull in the Gulf multiple times. Okay, only to call my wife and say, "Send me another roll out here." But but that's another story. But but look, and I was reading the scripture, and I was trying to do all this stuff. And then and then there were times in my life when I wasn't really going to church like I should have. Wasn't really because we are supposed to read the word. We are supposed to be in the house of God and we are supposed to pray. But, but this is the thing. I didn't understand this. I didn't understand that righteousness was Jesus and it was given to me as a gift based on my faith. And I thought my righteousness was based upon what I was doing instead of what Christ did. And I can remember being at Walmart and they were like, hey, I hadn't seen you in a little while. Yeah, man, I need to get back in the house of God. And it's true I needed to be in the house of God, but not in order to be right with God. If I go to the house of God and somebody's preaching the truth about God, then hopefully I can learn and get a revelation of what it means to be right with God. But if I'm not in the house of God and I'm not reading the word of God, how will I ever learn what it means to be right with God? But what it means to be right with God is that you've been given a gift, amen, of righteousness through Jesus Christ. And now, now that I learned to believe that every day, grace is flowing in my life. And now he, listen, I was in Venezuela one time for 35 days on the job. And I was used to job. Uh, it was an oil field job. And the reason I'm trying to say that is this, is that I never saw anything like this before. Fruit trees were everywhere. And there was just rotten fruit all over the, all over the streets that I was running on because you had fruit trees everywhere. And whenever I remember that after the Lord got a hold of me because I used to struggle with things like lust and I used to struggle with things like tobacco and I used to struggle. I would stay away from alcohol for a period of time and then, and they, then the next thing you know, I'm going like a little, I'm having some trouble with it again. And, and, and what I'm trying to say is this, is that when the Lord finally set me free and gave me a revelation of what I'm trying to talk to you about, it was, I remember running in Venezuela. I remember seeing the dead, the rotten fruit on the tree and I, I remember the Holy Spirit saying it, it, that everything that you were trying to get rid of, everything you were trying to be free from, look at it now. Look at what's happening. Now that the Spirit of God is moving in your life, it's like ripe tree falling, it's like ripe fr fruit falling off a tree. You're not even, you're not having to do it. Do you understand? Now that doesn't mean you don't make right decisions. That doesn't mean you don't do the right things. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is all your life, you might have been struggling and then now you begin to understand it's His work doing it in you and as you trust in his finished work now the grace of the Holy Spirit is moving 
in your life. And he is bringing the freedom and the liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Praise God. Praise God. The thing that you can never get free from, the Lord just took it. In one moment. Do you believe that tonight? Yeah. I just want to encourage you. That you can believe that tonight. That what Jesus did when he said it is finished. I'm here to tell you that he finished the work. Amen. I'm excited about it. Because you know it's hard to get excited about it. If you never experienced it. There's been times. And I'm telling you right now. The Lord done rescued me. More than once. And I have seen him turn the power of sin off in my life. I have seen through horrible decisions where I've opened the door back up to sin and the power of sin. And we'll get into the sinful nature when we get into Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7. But I have seen the power of sin rise back up because of my own bad decisions to open up the door to sin. And yet even still, when I would cry out to God and I would allow the Lord to have his way, it's just like he turned the valve off and he rescued me from the bondage. Amen. He deserves his glory. And I got to tell you tonight that he wants to do it for you in here. Amen. Amen. And so that's what sanctification means. I kind of fin didn't finish earlier, but it means to be set apart. Yes. You're not like you used to be. Right. You're not who you used to be. You used to be that, but that's not who you are anymore. Amen? Because, why? Because God says so. Amen? That's a good word. God says so. And so he, he goes on to say this in, in verse, this is Galatians 2 verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. You know what that means if you've been crucified with Christ? It means your old man is dead. He said, but I live. So your old man is dead, but a new man has been resurrected. There's so many scriptures that talk about this. Romans 6, Romans 12 and 2. Okay. He said, I mean, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want you to see verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, again, I need you to understand, when I worked offshore, my favorite book to read was Romans. I mean, I, like, I lived in some rough times in the, in the oil field, my friend, because, see, back then, pornography was allowed everywhere. I'd have people coming up in the room, like, trying to, ah, hi, little Christian boy, what you doing, and flashing all this stuff. And I'm just like, over there, like, Lord, I got to keep my eyes on this word. Amen. Hey, I don't know why people would want to do that, but that's the kind of stuff that they did. And, and, and I was just like, I, I was putting, I was putting all my, I was trying to, to read enough to get my mind right. Amen. And trying to do these things and things weren't working. And I need to, but whenever I would get to the part of Romans where it talked about the law, I thought, well, he's not talking to me. I'm not a Jew, but I got to tell you that, listen, I hope that this makes sense. When Adam and Eve fell, what is the first thing they did? They tried to cover themselves. Right? And, and, and they did that through fig leaves, right? Do you, you think God sowed them fig leaves? No, they, they made the fig leaves. They made for themselves aprons. And they, and they covered it. The work of their own hands in an attempt to cover their nakedness and their separation from God. But what did God do? God, God, what did He do? He, 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 He performed the first sacrifice, did He not? He clothed them with skins of an animal. He didn't go to the textile factory and purchase some fur. No, He killed an animal. And if you go back and you read the text, the Scripture teaches that before, before the flood, man and beast alike were herbivores. Why does that matter? There was no reason to kill an animal except because it required the shedding of blood for the remission of sins. We learn that. So the work of their hands could not cover their sin. It required the work of the hands of God. That's why the scripture says in Isaiah 53, it pleased him, the father, to bruise him, the son. It pleased the father to bruise the son because he was providing a sacrifice for you. He was providing a sacrifice 
for me. Amen. But whenever we try to do the work ourselves, we frustrate the grace of God. Let me just give you a little definition. It means to thwart. To thwart the efficacy. That's a big word. We use it in medicine. It means the effectiveness. To stop the effectiveness of anything. To frustrate it. To void it. So what is this text saying? This text is saying is that if your faith is in what you do instead of what he did. And you're trying to perform that you could literally be tying the hands of the Holy Spirit in your life. Yeah. You and I need to come to the place at the end of ourselves. Yeah. You and I need to come to the end of ourselves and to say, Lord, we need you. Yeah. We need your grace flowing and operating Amen. in our lives. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So in, in, in verses 6 through 8 of Romans 4, it says this, Just as David speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those, this is David, is, this is being quoted out of uh, Psalm uh, 51 and Psalm 32. Okay, it says, blessed, this is David talking right here, you ready? Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now, I don't have, I'm not going to have time to, to actually go through the whole chapter, okay? So I just want to explain a couple of things to you. The first example was Abraham. The next example was David, okay? The scripture in chapter 4 says that the promises were given to Abraham before or after he was circumcised. That's the question I'm asking. You know, I mean, if you can remember, that's fine. If not, I'm about to answer it for you. Scripture says, thank you. Scripture says in Romans 4 that the promises were given to Abraham before he was circumcised. Why? Because if not, then the Jews would still be believing today or they would have believed no matter what that they were the only ones that could be saved. But the scripture is very clear. The apostle Paul's explaining it. And let me tell you something. It's important we understand this. A big part of the context is bringing correction to the Jewish believers that were in the church of Rome. Because the Jewish believers were still thinking that they were superior to the Gentiles. And the apostle Paul said, hold on a second. The promises given to our father Abraham were given to him. He actually asked the question, were they given before circumcision or after? He said before. Because see, Abraham was going to be the father of many nations. And I, and I need you to understand something. I believe this with all my heart. You may not know this, but Abraham also had a son with Ishmael with, with uh, Hagar. Y'all know that? That's where the Muslim people come from. Okay, it's a long story. We're not going to go through that. But, but there's a whole nation of people that came from Abraham. He also had sons from a woman named Keturah. That's not what the text is talking about. He's a father of many nations because this is what the Lord told him. Come out of your father's house and I will make you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And the families of the earth will be blessed through your seed. Abraham, through Abraham came the nation of Israel. Through the nation of Israel came Jesus. Through Jesus, every tongue Tribe and nation can, is, it has the opportunity to be born again. All families of the earth are blessed. Who are the children of Abraham? Those that believe by faith. It's a nation. I'll put it in my notes. It's a nation of faithers. It's not a word. I made it up. It's a nation of faithers. Those that are believing in. I didn't make it up. I think it was her name. What's her name? Uh. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. That, that old scholar girl that was married to Jean yeah. Scott. Yeah, she said, <laughs> favor. Melissa. Yeah. Melissa, Scott. Melissa Scott. Let's give her credit. Yeah. Melissa Scott said, favors. Are you a favor? It's another way to say a believer. Are you walking by faith? Not by sight, but by faith. But faith in what? Faith in Christ. Yes. Faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. Why do we keep talking about the cross? Because it was there that his blood was shed. The innocent, sinless blood of Jesus. Not the skins of an animal in the garden. Not the skins of an animal or the death of an animal for the first Passover. Not the death of an animal for the day of atonement. But instead, you'll behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The blood of the eternal Lamb. The Lamb that was sacrificed slain before the foundation of the earth. Amen. And, and, and praise God. 
that whenever we put faith in that, we now are clothed in the righteousness of God. And Abraham is the father of faith. And going back to Revelation 5, I don't think I can say it enough. You are worthy to open the scroll. For you have redeemed us from every tongue, tribe, and nation. You're a peculiar people. A holy nation. That you would show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Your purpose on earth is to give glory to the God that saved you. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching the truth. Your purpose on earth is to give glory to him. Hallelujah. The Father receives glory when the Son receives his glory. And we can give glory to the eternal Lamb of God. We thank you, Jesus. From our heart, we give you glory. We give you gratitude. We give you, I'm thankful. I don't know who else is thankful in here, but he saved me. All my sisters again let me. I would not have let that dude sleep in my house. I don't know what y'all were thinking. Y'all let me sleep at y'all's house. But that was such a mess. But praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. He changed people's lives. He changed my life. He changed your life. But will you believe it? Come on. Will you believe it or will you try to earn it? Will you be a favor or will you be a worker? Amen. Now, what's, now let, me, let me just say this. Now, don't, don't let me give you a half truth. Once you get a revelation of this and you become free in Christ and all that right fruit starts falling off of you and you start to get free in your spirit, you're going to be the reading this Bible reader that anybody ever knew. You're going to be the prayer closet is praying person. They're going to say, come out the closet. No way coming out the closet. We're going to spend time in the closet with the Lord. Hallelujah. You're going to be the most church going brother and sister because you're going to be overwhelmed with the goodness of God. You're going to have a desire to serve him. You're going to have a desire to go to the nations and tell other people about him or go down to the convenience store and tell somebody about him or go to the workplace and tell somebody about him because he's worthy. You can't hold that in, man. Thank you, Jesus. David said this blessed is he whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not count his sin. So Abraham was before the law ever was. Abraham was before circumcision. If I had time to draw the chronology, but look, the point is this, Abraham was circumcised. The law didn't come till, till 1450 B.C. Abraham was 2000 B.C. It was almost 400, 500 years before the law ever came. But now David's living under the law. David writes Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. And, and David says, David says this. Let me, let me, I'm just going to go to those. Let's go to Psalm 51. He says, blessed is the man who the Lord will not count his sin against him. Let's just read some of this. He says, have mercy upon me, O God. You know what David did before we get into this? You know what, you know what David, the sins David committed? He committed two, two major sins. He committed adultery. Right? He, 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 at a time when kings go off to war, David stayed home. There he saw Bathsheba, her beautiful self, and he called her over there. And he impregnated that man's one wife. Okay? He got that, he got that woman pregnant. He tried to hide it. He called Uriah the Hittite, who was a warrior. Uriah the Hittite is listed as one of David's mighty men. That means he was extremely loyal to the king. David called him off the battlefield, fed him some food, and said, go home with your wife now. David wakes up, scratching his head. He sees Uriah the Hittite sleeping at the doorstep. He calls him home. He says, why are you not in there with your wife? It'll never happen, king. Not while the men, not while the men are on the battlefield, I will not go into my wife. So that night he tries to get him drunk and send him home. Most men, whenever they're drunk, they're going to go in and meet after all is his wife. No, nope, he doesn't do it. And so you know what David does? He writes a letter to Joab the general and he says, put Uriah the Hittite on the front lines of the battle and whenever the enemy comes, shrink back from him that his life be taken. 
That's premeditated murder. And the Bible says of David that he was a man after God's own heart. Because let me tell you something, this world is filled with idolatry. This world is filled with false gods and people are worshiping everything. And they're saying Christ ain't king. And they're saying all of these other things. And they're coming against the God of glory. And I'm here to tell you that you and I are facing it right here whether we realize it or not. There's every other God that, that people, anyway, let me, let, me, let me stay focused. And so, so, so there is no, you know what the law says for David? You got to be stoned, not once, but twice. I mean, because that, there was no sacrifice. You understand in the Old Testament law, they had to offer sacrifices once they realized they had sinned. The law did not provide a sacrifice for adultery. The law did not provide a sacrifice for premeditated murder. It wasn't there. David goes on in Psalm 51. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me against you. And you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And I started thinking, you know, no, David did. He sinned against Bathsheba and he ruined her family. And he sinned against Uriah the Hittite. But you know what David's getting a revelation of? I sinned against God. I transgressed God. Yes. You, you understand what I'm saying? I sinned against God. Yes. I got to I got to do business with you, Lord. And there's no Levitical sacrifice. There's no animal sacrifice I can offer for my forgiveness. And I'm here to tell you. He goes on to say this. He says. He says in verse seven, "Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow." Oh, it's so good. See, when we read the Bible, we catch little hints like this. For the Passover, y'all remember the story of the Passover? Whenever the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, and he says, kill a lamb. And he says, take some hyssop and dip it in the blood and paint the doorpost and the side post with the blood. Go on the inside, eat that lamb. Ter perfect type of Christ. Go on the inside, eat the lamb. And he said, whenever I see the blood, I will pass over you. David is calling upon the blood. This is before grace. This is in the middle of law. He knows law can't save him. He cries out for grace. He says, purge me with hyssop. Paint my heart with your blood, O oh Lord. Forgive me. Wash me. Make me whiter than snow. Listen, I want to real quick. I'm about to close for you here in a second. But I want to just share with you a little bit out of Psalm 32. So listen, once you repent. I didn't really know that this is where we're going to focus on at the end. But once you come to the realization that you need to repent, because look, David hid it. David was trying to hide it. He thought he had gotten away with it. You remember the story, Nathan the prophet comes to him. And I've mentioned it recently, I believe. And I said, Nathan the prophet comes to him and he tells him the story. Remember that? He said, I think I said it last week or the last time I preached. He said that there was a rich man traveling and there was a, there was a, a, a rich, a, I'm sorry, there was a rich man that had a bunch of sheep. And there was a, a traveler coming through town. And there was a poor man that had one sheep. And, and, and that the scripture, uh, uh, Nathan the prophet said this. He said that, that, the, that the rich man went and said, I want your one sheep. I want your one sheep to feed this traveler. Okay. And, 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 and instead of the rich man using one of his sheep. And Nathan the prophet tells, tells him this story. And David turns around and he says this. He says, who is he? I'll take care of him. And David says, you're the man. You're the man. You're the guilty one. And what that did was it threw David into deep repentance. The Bible says that he fasted for a whole week. He clothed himself in sackcloth, hoping that God would be merciful to his offspring, uh, you know, with, with Bathsheba. And, and, and so, what I'm, but he wrote these two psalms after that happened. All right? And I want you to understand that in Psalm 32, he realizes that he was trying to hide the sin. He says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no God. Look at this. When I kept silence, my, I'm, I'm, in the King, I'm in the King James. I really want to be in the ESV. He says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away 
through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Look at verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Once he realized he needed to repent, he goes to the Lord with a humble heart. And he says, Lord, please forgive me. Against you alone did I sin. And then now, listen, whenever repentance comes, now your heart gets softened towards the Lord. Now in Psalm 51, he's crying out to him. He's like, Lord, against you and you alone did I sin. He goes on to say this, created me a clean heart, yes. Lord. Yes. Renew a right spirit in me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Yes. What a horrible place for any Christian to be. That we, would, that we would have been walking outside of God's will and our heart had become so hardened that we didn't even know it anymore. That the presence of God had been, come so distant from us that we didn't even know it. Lord, help us. Amen. Singers, musicians, maybe y'all could come forward. We're gonna, we'll go ahead and, and, and dismiss church.